you got victory over your enemy, be loud about it. One, two, three. Do it anytime, anywhere. Have a good time. Hey, we want to welcome those that are podcast, vidcast, whatever cast it is. Give them a big old living word hand clap right now. Thank you for allowing us into your cars, your homes, motorcycles, wherever that might be. If you're in the valley, make sure you come out and say, hey to us. And so St. Peter, is, he's got the duty today. He's at the pearly gates. And uh, up comes a guy, gives his name. And Peter's like, I don't see it in here. He's like, but you know what? I'm, I'm feeling awfully generous today. Can you, I'll let you in if you just give me a, something heroic that you did in your, in your lifetime, something just, just was amazing, uh, maybe saving somebody or doing something. And the guy thought for a moment and said, well, yeah, was something comes, comes to mind. He said, uh, there was one day I, I was walking and I just came across, uh, came upon a, a group of bikers who were uh, hassling a, a young lady. And so I walked up to the group and I said, hey, guys, uh, let's just knock it off. This is not how we treat a lady. He said, the biggest biker, big old biker, got the nose ring and everything else, walked up, big leather jacket, big guy, got right in his face and said, what are you going to do about it? He said, I thought for a moment, but then, you know, just some courage just rose up inside of me, and, and man, I just hit him as hard as I could right in the gut, right? I sucker punched him hard. He bent over. I grabbed him by the nose ring, and I yanked him down on the ground, and then I grabbed a handful of hair, and he said, I was just on it and on and on it. Well, St. Peter was like, oh, my gosh. He's like, that was amazing. When, when, when did all this happen? The guy said, eh, a couple minutes ago. <laughs> Come on, somebody out there. Open up your Bibles to Hebrews 11.1. 1. We got our donkeys with us today for our series, Big Old Assumptions. Got it from Grandpa when I was probably in, uh, maybe in elementary school and he sat me down and gave me a little teaching that when you assume, you become a donkey. No, donkey? I have to say this. Last week, Holly came in, in the back as I was getting ready to go up, and she didn't know anything about this, and she saw the donkeys. And she said, no, you can't do that. I don't think we can trust you to handle the responsibility. <laughs> uh, having the donkeys up there, but then at the end of the day, she said, you, were, you had self-control. Right? I had self-control. There's so many things and jokes I want to do. Right? My ass is not too big, right? He's, he's all right? I can do one. I only wanted one. Just, that's all I see looked at me. I got one. Can I do one? Can I have one? Can you give me one? Get, oh, I want one. I won't do no more. I just made a PG-13 service. Good for me. Your big old assumption is the reason for most of the problems in our lives. We get our assumptions that go on ahead of us. And, you know, because life is about your choices and the quality of choices that you make with your chooser, your belief system. But if you don't have truth and you have just assumptions, then you're choosing based most of the time on lies and making bad decisions that you think are good, which keep making bad results, which you're wondering why. The only thing that you can do is Romans 12, 2, renew your mind with God's Word. Get those old assumptions out. Get His truth inside of you so that you can experience His perfect will in your life. As long as you have wrong assumptions about relationships, your relationships will always fall very short from what God wants you to have. As long as you have the wrong assumptions about, about power and about people that are in authority, as long as you have the wrong assumptions about money, and as long as you have the wrong assumptions about what God wants to do for your life, and, and he, want, he, he, he wants to take money from you, and he, he doesn't want you to have money. He doesn't want you to have life. As long as you have wrong assumptions, your assumptions, not the truth, are guiding and directing your life. Our goal is to get as much truth in us. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's your ex. That word hope is not a wish. Well, I just, I just hope that, you know, I, I make a little bit more money this year. No, no, that's a, that's a really bad wish is all that is. There is no expectation behind that. That word hope is a positive expectation. See, I know that I'm going to make more this year than I made last year. I know I'm going to be more blessed this year than last year. I know my marriage is going to get better this year than it was last year. That's a positive expectation. That faith activates out of my expectation, and it brings the substance into my life. I hope tomorrow's a good day. No, I know tomorrow's a good day. I expect tomorrow is a good day. And my day just follows my expectations. But a lot of people live a life on fear. Fear is the substance of things you assume. 
And so your fear works just like faith. And you assume tomorrow's going to be another bad day. Well, guess what? There's no proof that it's a bad day. It's just your assumption that it'll be a bad day. Well, you know, I don't know if God will ever bring Mr. Right into my life. See, that's not the truth because God's got Mr. Right for you. But until you change your big old assumption, God can't bring Mr. Right into your life because fear continues to drive you in the other direction in your life. You can use it for everything because people go forth with their assumptions in life. We, we, we adapt to the world system and their assumptions that they placed upon us in order for me to get ahead in life. I got to get. It's all about getting. I got to take, take, take. I got to take in my relationships. I got to take in my marriage. It's about what I can get out of life. It's about what I can get out of the company. It's what I can get. And see, a life like that never goes anywhere. Your assumptions are producing an empty life. Instead, the Word says the truth is that it's not what I get, but it is what I give. And the more that I give in my marriage, the more I end up receiving in my, life, in my marriage. The more I give in my job, the more I receive in my finances. And so it's not a get, but instead it's a give. But the assumptions that are in your heart continue to drive your life. Everything is an assumption. Where do you assume in life? What do you assume about? And so we're trying to break all those different assumptions that you have in all the different areas, whatever those might be. Um, we talked about the guy with the talents, and uh, that's kind of been our story for this series. And uh, just a quick recap of the talent story. Uh, one guy got five, one got two, one got one. We know the story. The master said, here you go. Here's 100 grand. That's what one talent is worth, we found out last week. And so here's 100 grand, here's 200 grand, here's 500 grand. He left, he come back. The guy with 500 grand doubled up, said, hey. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come join me in my happiness in life. And then the guy that did two, he got the exact same phrase. Even though he only doubled up two, it didn't matter. You're not judged based on what somebody else gets. You got judged on based on what you do with what you got. And so we all got different stuff. And so he got the same reward that the guy with five. And then, of course, we know the story of the one. He buried his talent, and he said to the master, he said, I knew you to be a hard man. I knew you to, to take and, and to be a taker in life, and, and you take stuff that you didn't sow. And, and so because of that, I just buried it. And see, his assumption about his master dictated his choices, which then got him in the circumstance where he was cast out and what he had was taken away from him. See, it wasn't the truth, but it was his assumption because when you look at the story, the master didn't seem to be a taker, did he? He gave him all money to, to, to do something with. He also, when the guys did good with the money, he said, come join me in my happiness. And so everything that you assumed about the master was not true, but your assumptions, not the truth, were guiding your life. And it was your big old assumption that got in the way from you getting God's best in your future, in your life, and in your circumstances. Same thing for you and I, your big old assumptions. What do you assume? We want to replace that with the truth of God. Uh, my new community, we moved in uh, last August, a gated community, and uh, that's the new big thing because there's no way that a bad guy could ever figure out how to get through that gate that opens all the time. You know, it's just so safe and so secure. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so secure. And so in our, in our little community of safety that we have, and it's a good one. Homeowners associations normally are, are run by Bills Above, but ours maybe not. It's not that bad. And uh, um, except for, for whatever reason, most of the other communities we've been part of, every year they got oil up the roads. And so you guys probably a lot of you have been through that. And what most every other place has done is they oil half the road one day, right? And then they oil the other half the next day, and then you can drive, right? But my community, in just a genius, brilliant move, decided that what we're going to do is we're going to oil all of the road, and it's just simple. All we're going to ask you to do is power outside the community and hike seven miles to your house. Seems like a great idea, does it not? <laughs> so I show up, and I'm trying to get my thing, and it's all wall taped off and everything else, and then I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I got to park, not just down the road, because now you remember, everybody in the community has to park outside of Jericho here. And so, <laughs> so I got to park way down the block, and then I got to walk all the way to the opening, right? And then come all the way back to the house, and by the time it's hot, and I'm annoyed, and it's just, 
it's what it is. And so the next day, I get up in the morning and study in and kind of put some stuff together. And all of a sudden, I get a text from my assistant. Hey, don't forget, you got a meeting. And I'm like, of course I didn't forget, which I did forget. And so right away, all right, boom, I get all dread ready. And I'm running out the door. And I hate to be late. And so I'm not going to be late. I'm right on time. And I open up the garage. And I go, where's my car? 47 years old. My mind doesn't work as good as it used to. I'm like, who stole my car? You're going to be kidding me. My car is gone. And so I'm thinking, which kid took the car? I'm trying to figure it out. And I open the garage to see maybe I, I don't know where. And then I notice the streets were oiled up. And I'm like, oh. And then I get so angry. I'm just mad now because now I'm almost going to be late. And now I got to huck it. You know? And so here I am. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just hauling all the way down the street trying to get to the car fast enough. And it's a little warm out. And I got the jacket on. And so now we got the cool little, right? And so... And the whole way I'm doing this, I'm talking to myself. And that's what I like to do. So, and I wasn't praying. I was telling myself <laughs> the letter that I was going to write to the homeowners to, to let them know in a kindly, pastorly way how stupid they are. And so I get all the way. Finally, I get to the, you know, the, little, the little exit gate for the people, right? The little gate. I get to the gate. And so I'm like, all right, here we go. And so I go to open the door, and it's locked. Here's my question. I get why you may want to lock the outside, but who are we trying to keep in the community that we don't want them to escape? <laughs> are there people in this area that were like, hey, we don't want them out, and so we need to lock the inside of the gate? This greatly troubled me and rose my pastoral anger even to another level. There's a little keypad there, and so I'm like, well, I've never used it before, but I assume Right? I assume it's the same as the, 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 the big drive-in gate. And so I punch in the little number, and I go, nothing. Mm, maybe I did it wrong, so I punch it in again. Nothing. I punch it in as hard as anyone's ever punched in a number in their life. I punch that thing in so hard and so annoyed, and I hit it. And, I, and as I grabbed that, my mind got to thinking, I, do I have to jump the fence to get to the meeting? Can I jump the fence at 47 years old? I don't think I can even make it over the fence. Do I want to see Jesus today? I don't know if I want to. Like, these are all the questions in my mind. And the only thing that I could think to do is I wanted to make sure I handled this as much as Joel Osteen or any great spirit-filled pastor could handle it. And so I let out under my breath so, so, some, some good words. I let them out. And then I kicked the gate as hard as I possibly could kick it. And then I stood there and I stared at it and I was angry. But you know how you can, you can just sense that somebody is like watching you? And so I, I turned around and here's like a little eight-year-old kid on a bike. that's right behind me. Well, now I feel bad. I mean, he may have heard me. I, more the, the way it always works in my story, he goes to my church probably, right? And so I don't know. That's how all my stories are. And so I'm like, I, I am so sorry. I, I, like, I'm a, I am so sorry. He said, for what? I said, oh, you, you didn't hear me. He goes, no, I heard you. I said, well, I said, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I, I mean, he goes, oh, my dad says that all the time. I'm like, well, that doesn't make it right. I said, just that, you know, I got a meeting I'm trying to get to, and the gate, the stupid gate is locked, and I can't get out to my car, because, and here I am counseling with this kid, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of leaning on him for some support and some guidance in life, this little eight-year-old kid. I'm like, so I, I can't get to my car, and I don't want to climb the fence, and I don't know what to do, and so he, he just stared at me. They had this real questioning look on his face. He just stared at me, and then he looked at the gate, and then he looked over to the right, and then he looked at me again. He goes, you want to get out? I said, yeah, I, I, I want to get out. He goes, well, why don't you just go out the big open gate right there? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. This is true. Here's, here's the gate I'm working on. Here's a two-foot pillar. Here's 40 feet of open gate. <laughs> Wide open. <laughs> That's what he was right there. Right there. My big old assumption got me so focused on this little gate right here that I could not see the 40-foot open gate that was two feet off to my right. And I wonder how many Christians are two feet from what God's best is in their life. 
They're two feet away from a great marriage. They're two feet away from finances. They're two feet away from a business that is exploding. They're so close. But their big old assumptions of what they can do and what they can have and what they can experience keeps them from looking up to where their direction, their eyes need to be pointed up here instead of right down here in my circumstances, my problems. Come on, somebody out there. So we're talking about the, uh, the, the big old assumptions in our life, the dangerous assumptions that we have. Last week we talked about our ability, our ability in life and how we assume that we're a one-talent person. And just because you're a one-talent person doesn't mean you have to stay there. Because if I worked out one talent long enough, even the Bible says I can double that thing up to two. And I can take that two up to four and I take that four up to eight. And though you started off with one talent, you have the ability to multiply that talent. That's what's awesome. See, don't assume because you're a half-talent person that you're stuck at a half-talent the rest of your life. Because a half-talent person usually has more motivation than the superstar that everything comes easily. They find that the most successful people in the world today are not the most talented. They're the ones that are least talented that work the heck out of the talents that they have been given. And so if you're like me that started off as a one-talent guy, but you worked that talent and you found yourself two, four, eight, sixteen, you found yourself now getting to the place where you become a millionaire in talents, it is because you worked what was given to you. You didn't just plant it. You didn't assume that the level of life that you're on is a level that you are stuck at. God has a higher level. Can I get an amen out there for anybody out there? Now, you guys all remember the uh, Chris Hems, whatever his stupid name is, picture that I threw up last week. See if they throw that stupid thing up again. Throw it up there, Betsy. Get him. No? Oh, you threw him a little one. You remember it? You guys know him? Yeah, I can hear. Oh, oh my God. I'm healed, Pastor. I just got healed. I just looked at it. And I just got healed. The anointing is so strong today. Thank you so much. But, <laughs> Mr. Start off with five talent, the perfect guy, and everything else. And, and, and it's just, this, this, guys, does it make you throw up just a little bit in your throat when you see it? Just a little bit. So this is a fun little, neat little story. So I'm an iPhone, condescending iPhone person. That's what I am. I have the iPhone. And then many of my friends who are less blessed, I guess, are stuck with like an Android, a Galaxy, a Samsung. I pray for them. I, I'm sorry that you have to have something inferior. And uh, boy, they turn very quickly. A lot of Android users out there. Good to have you. It's, but it's a game that we play. And so me and my friends, I know some of you are even out there now, where I make fun of your stupid droid and you make fun of my, my iPhone. And this, this is how you know men love each other because we make fun of each other. That's how you know it. And so one of the things that we do, yeah, men, you can clap. Yeah, all right. And so we do. We, we, we like to harass. And so one of the things that I do and they do is we make it sound like their phone is girly. And so your little girl, did your little Android, did it come with a pair of nylons? And they're like, oh, did it? Right? And they're like, oh, does your iPhone give you cramps? Right? And so like, oh, we do. <laughs> All right. So that, but just, I'm just being real with you right now. This is what we do. Right? Do you get a free pedicure every time you make an Android call? And so we do little girly calls. And so I was showing my buddy on my phone. I had a picture of one of the new products coming out. And I gave him the phone to look at the picture. And he's looking at it. Now, many people know when somebody hands your phone, there is common courtesy that you don't swipe through their pictures because you don't know what you're going to see. <laughs> you don't just start swiping through. You're going to see things that your eyes were not meant to see. The phone, he goes, and so he swipes. Well, when I did the Chris pick, what I do is I find pick, and then I send it to Betsy. Well, I didn't delete it. <laughs> so he swipes, and he's like, well, don't you have a girly crush on somebody? <laughs> Did your iPhone come with a copy of Teen Beat magazine? Is that what you got? <laughs> it's all right at your age to have infatuation. <laughs> so now he can assume that my girly iPhone, I got pictures of Chris all over the place. Our assumptions can get us in trouble. Number two. I thought that was fun. All right, number two is safety. The safety assumption. Number two is the safety assumption. Uh, no risk assumption. The just sit back and take no chance assumption. Whatever it might be. We assume in life, the majority of people, that 
life is going to have more rewards if I play it safe. And that is the exact opposite of how life works. The talent guy was safer by burying the talent. But in the playing it's safe, he's the one that ends up losing it all. God said his very first command to man was, and a woman, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Come on. I can't be fruitful if I don't step out. Well, pastor, if I step out, I might fail. No, if you don't step out, you have already failed in life. Failure happens from the lack of stepping out. When you step out and it doesn't go your way, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means that you have grown in an ability. See, when you're teaching a one-year-old is learning how to walk, that one-year-old has to stand up and it has to step out. And yes, the one-year-old is going to fall and it's going to get up and it's going to fall again. But every time it stands up, it builds the muscles, it builds the, the balance that it needs, it builds the wisdom that it needs so that it can work itself up to being able to run in life. If that baby just sits there and says, hey, when I can walk is when I'll stand up, you never get to walk. You're going to have to fall. And so in my own life, it's when I have stepped out and fallen, I did not fail, but I grew and I matured and I got more wisdom so that I could step and run in different areas of life. I had to have 13 failed businesses and a whole bunch of boo-boos for me to be able to have a highly successful business. If I wouldn't have fallen all those times, I wouldn't have had success. See, and I want you to grab a hold of this. God cannot bless your city. He cannot. He can't bless it. Do you know that God cannot get the book that he put in your heart in a publisher's hands until you write it? God cannot get that song on the charts that he put in your heart until you write it. He cannot bless a business you never start. He can't bless something that you have not done. In order for him to bless it, you have to do it. He could not give the Israelites Jericho until they started to march around it. As long as they sat out in the wilderness, they didn't get to have it. Because God can only bless what you do. It must, it, it, I think it, oftentimes it can be very frustrating because God puts an invention in your heart, but you never step out in it, and you wonder why God hasn't blessed it. He's like, I can't bless it until you do it. You got to do it until I can bless it. I bless whatever you put your hands to, but you just put your hands to the remote control, and you have the most blessed cable television in America. <laughs> See, it's like one of my knives that when my knife is in safety mode, it's useless. You can't cut anything. You can't do anything. You can't cut fishing line when it's in safety mode. I have to take it out of safety mode for it to be useful. Many Christians have put themselves in safety mode. I'm just being safe. I'm just playing it safe. Just play everything safe. Don't take any risks. Just do what I got to do is what, of course, the world wants you to do. And just play it safe and give all your money here and there. And so I'm in safety mode. No, it's not till you switch off a of safety mode that I can begin to become useful, where I can cut some twine, I can cut some packages open, I can begin to do some stuff when I take my life off of safety. As long as you're sitting back and waiting for your walls of Jericho to fall down, I'm here to tell you, it isn't going to happen. Life rewards risks. Life rewards those that step out. God can only work in somebody who's doing something. And as long as the only thing you're doing is small... All he can bless you is within the small, but as soon as you do something big and you step out in something large, when God put a dream in your heart, it wasn't just to give you something to go to sleep at night, but it was something to inspire you to step out and do something that he has called you to do. He can't. You put a movie in your heart to write, but you haven't written it. He can't bless it. A business in your heart, but he can't bless it until you step out and doing it. When I uh, first started playing baseball in the third grade, and uh, I struck out the first few times I got up to bed. I was pretty decent at the time, but I struck out. And, and we got into a big game, and, and the coach came to me. And he said, hey, uh, the next one, just don't swing. Just don't swing at all. So I got up. I didn't swing, and I got on base because I don't know if you knew this, but I, I used to be short. And so my strike zone, 
And he told me, get real low, get real, right? And they used to say, make yourself small. I'm like, that's easy. And so I make myself small. So my little strike zone was so hard in the third grade. And for the rest of the season, I never struck out, and I never had to swing at the ball. And I got on base every time. I got up in the lineup. The coach used to love that. In the fourth grade, same philosophy, boom. And I got struck out some, but I made it on the base a lot of the times. In the fifth grade, the kids, for whatever reason, they, they begin to get a whole lot better at baseball. And so the first three times I got up for bat, boom, I just three strikes in a row. Because these kids have known, they've been playing with me. They know I'm not going to swing at the ball. They just throw three down the middle, out. Three down the middle, out. Three down the middle. And so we go through three games, I don't know, nine strikeouts in a row. And finally my dad's like, son, how come you're not swinging at the ball? And so I'm doing the same thing I do every year. I'm like, I'm doing it. Right. Like, he's like, no, no, you, gotta, you need to swing at the ball. I said, but if I swing, I'll strike out. He said, but you're already striking out. <laughs> so... Seems like you're just, get, you're just getting, if you don't swing, you're going to strike out. If you do swing, at least you have a chance of the ball. He said, son, I would rather you go down swinging than to go down watching the ball walk by. And so I did. I went out. And because they expected me not to swing, they throw it right down the middle, and I hit that first ball. And then I hit the second one. I struck out on the third one. And then the next game, I think I had the same thing, two or three in a row. And I went from being on the bottom of the batting list to being number two in the batting list by simply doing the swinging in life. If you don't swing, you're going to strike out. If you assume that just playing it safe and not swinging at anything at all is going to give you just an epic life, I'm here to tell you it isn't going to work out that way. The most successful people in the world, you got to listen to me, the most successful people in the world are the ones who have had the most failures. They have. They, they, they interviewed the, uh, the founder of IBM, and they, they, this young man said to him, he said, ha, I want to become successful really fast. He's like, what, what, what one tip could you give me to, to, to increase how fast I, I become successful? And the founder of IBM, he said, double the rate of your failure. Double the rate of your failure. That doesn't even make sense to most of when we hear that. We're like, why would I double how many things I fail on? Because if I can double how many times that kid gets up and tries to walk, I can double how fast he can begin to walk and begin to run in life. If you can double how many things you try and how many things you step out in, it doubles how fast that you grow in life. Double how many things you swing at. The most successful people in this world are the ones who fail the most. You look at baseball and who has struck out the most? Well, you got Sammy Sosa. Right? You got Babe Ruth, you got Reggie Jackson. Some of the best baseball players in the world ever known are the ones who struck out and had the most failures. In football, you know who threw the most interceptions? Brett Favre. One of the greatest quarterbacks. Oh, Lord, thank you for Green Bay Packers. Lord, thank you right now for them. Yeah, oh, Lord. One of the greatest quarterbacks, Dan Marino, some of us, John Elway. These, I'm telling you, top five all-time interceptions. See, if they would have played the game so they never had an interception, they never would have been successful in football, and nobody ever would have put them in the game. They had to throw the ball and take a chance and throw the most interceptions to be able to have the most touchdowns and the most successes. Same thing for you. Do not be like the servant who took their talent and played safe with and put it in the ground. I wonder in this church how many things are in the ground. I wonder how many movie scripts are in the ground. I wonder how many million-dollar businesses are in the ground. I wonder how many books are in the ground. I wonder how many singers that are just sitting out there who's got a voice that was given them by God to lead worship or to have a record or to have an album. I wonder how many of you out there, God has put something in your heart, but you put it in the ground because I'm afraid that I might fail with it, but you've already failed. One of my favorite quotes is, is, put that quote up there for me, Betsy. Opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. Some yeah. yes. of you need to put that up in your car because every opportunity has a lifetime to it. And many of us go, man, I miss this and I miss this and I miss this. What's amazing about God is God will just continue to bring you open gates in your life. And so don't get in condemnation, well, I missed this and I missed that, but instead look ahead and go, okay, even though I missed some other ones, God's got some bigger opportunities ahead of me, and I will not miss another Jericho. I will not miss another giant. I will not miss another Goliath. I will not miss another opportunity in my life. When God puts something in my heart, I will not bury it. But instead, we as a church, we are a church that steps out. And if it doesn't matter, you know what, I bet you if the, if the servant would have came to us and said, I lost it all. You know what? I, I put 100 grand on Enron, and Enron didn't turn out very well. And so I lost all of it. I'll bet you that he'd have been happy because I can work with a failure. 
I can work with a kid that's trying to learn how to ride a bike that at least get on a bike. If I have a kid that won't even get on a bike, I can't tutor you. How can I help you ride a bike when you won't get on the stupid bike? you got to get on for me to teach you. you got to get out and fail at some stuff so God can lead and guide you and direct you. It's time that we get on a bike. Come on, somebody out there. You need to get on a bike with that idea. You need to get on the bike with that business. You need to get on the bike. Well, what if I fall off? Good, get back up. Get right back on that bike and keep riding it. Because my daddy always said, you cannot steer a bike that is not moving. Amen. Well, God, guide me and direct me. Well, God can't do anything until you start moving. As soon as I step, he can say, hey, go this way, go this way, go this way. Now he can direct me, but I have to be moving in order to be directed. Number four, we're going to close with this next one. Number three. Number three is the assumption of significance. Most people assume that their value is far lower than it actually is, that my life is not significant. Who am I? Pastor, you don't, you don't know my childhood. You don't know my hurts. You don't know that I, I've been through a divorce, and I've been through a, a, this, and I've been through that, and I've been through a bankruptcy, all these things. And so the enemy wants you to assume that your brokenness and the things that happened in your past somehow decreased your value. What's interesting to me that when I read the Bible and when I look around the world around me, I tend to see that God likes to use the people with the most flaws. He likes to take the most flawed people out into a flawed world and say, look what God can do shining through something that is flawed. Most successful people. You think of the woman at the well. She was on her gajillionth marriage. And who did Jesus use to save the whole town? He used her. I'm sure there's a lot of people he could have used. But he chose probably the one with the most flaws. He's got to get some of you excited out there that I got a whole bunch of flaws. You're like, man, because the more flaws I have, it seems like the more God can do and use through me. He used Paul, a murderer of Christians, to write most of the New Testament. I hire people all the time. How many people know that if I find out that murderer? No. I don't think we're hiring you. Like, I don't go, oh, that's great, a murderer. We've been looking for a guy like you. This is what God looks for. He looks for the bottom of the barrel. He looks for Rahab the prostitute. He looks for who people who have negative things in their past, who've got brokenness in their past. That's who he looks for. Now watch this. There's an old uh, uh, Chinese, uh, excuse me, Japanese uh, tradition. Throw that up there. It's called Kintsugi. Now, hopefully I said that right. My wife was on me. Kintsugi. We're going to say it. That's the way I say it. That's the way we should all say it. Kintsugi. <laughs> and what kintsugi is, is when they, when they break a, a vase or a pot or a cup or something else, what they do is they take um, a, 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 a very costly resins. So they'll take gold. They'll take silver. They'll, they, they, they'll take these resins and they'll, they'll piece it back together. Throw some of the pictures up for me. And so they'll... Yeah, keep that big picture. I like that up on there. And so they'll take these parts and, and they'll put the, the pots back together. And what they've done is they, they took something that was very common. Everybody has this bowl. Though it was broken, and now once they put that gold resin in that, now it greatly uh, increased its value. It went from common to, in a sense, one of a kind. And some of you are already ahead of the picture, and I want you to know, that you've been broken in the past and you've been torn apart in the past, that we serve a God that takes his resin and with his resin of grace and he puts you together with his love. He puts you together with his peace. He puts you together with his purpose and something that was common becomes priceless, something that can be used where you have been placed. I don't care how broken your past is. I don't care how bad things happen in your past. It doesn't change your significance. Because when God puts you back together, He puts you together in a priceless way. You're one of a kind. And only you can minister in the place that He put you in, in the way that He designed you to minister in. Only you can be the testimony in that job, in the place He put you in. Only you can make a difference in the world that He put you in. And that you are not insignificant. That you weren't here just to suck up some air, but instead, you have been put together by Jesus Christ to do some incredible, amazing things in this lifetime. Do not devalue your significance. You were made for greatness. Like I said, you look at Joyce Myers and what she went through. What she went through, of course, wasn't from God, but God turns the bad into the good. Now I'm telling you here, 
I could minister to the ladies that have gone through the stuff that the ladies have gone through like she can. She can say, hey, I've been through sexual abuse, physical abuse, and emotional abuse that most you can't even imagine. But look what Christ was able to do in me. Look that I have the joy of the Lord. Look at the success that I can have. Look that you can overcome it. Look that you can put it behind you. Look that you can press forward to what's up ahead of you. And so you may be broken. You may be shattered. You may have gone through some stuff. But it only increases your value. That's all it does. It just increases how valuable you are. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity right now. It's very simple. It's very easy. We're all going to say a prayer out loud. If you say it with me, you have it. Oftentimes we assume that we're not good enough. But it's the truth that says, whosoever believeth. That's not based on your works. The Bible says you can't get into heaven through your works. And so you can't be good enough. And you can't jump through enough hoops. That's just an assumption that the enemy wants people to believe so they just stay out of church and stay out of God's house. Once again, an assumption driving people away from what's best in their life. But the truth is that God loves you just the way you are. He doesn't change anything about you. He just wants to come into your heart today. He wants you to believe that his son died on the cross for your sins, all of them, your sins. Everything you've done and everything you're going to be. He says, I just want to love you and spend eternity with you. And all you have to do is say this prayer with me. And you have it. That's truth and that's fact. Everybody's going to say it out loud so you won't be embarrassed. Everybody say this with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you right now, forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. And my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, got my big old assumptions in front of me. Where do you put these? Do you take them in front of you? It's time that we get the truth in you. Get into that word. Listen to all the podcasts you can. That's how the best way to get rid of your assumptions is to get more truth because faith cometh by hearing. I got to hear what I can have. I got to hear what I can do. Got to get yourself into church. Hey, I need you to help me get this message all over the world. And how do we do that? Just get on the web right now and, and just give. Don't ask God how much, just how much. Be a blessing. It allows me to take this message all over the world because you're a part of that. And every person that is saved, you're a part of that. Every soul that is reached, you're a part of that. So I encourage you just to give right now. Hey, you be blessed. I'll see you next time.